allow me to reintroduce myself. Now tuned into the greatest. What's up, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the Supreme Decisions Legal Minute podcast. And today, you know, as usual, your host is Supreme Decisions. Well, what I want everybody to do is first off, if you're looking for a face mask, use the face mask shop USA.com. Have great durable face mask, and yes, this is my shameless plug because we're not going to have any advertisements during this episode. Simply because there are a lot of things that I want to cover, and along with covering them, I want to give you talking points where you can leave comments, you can ask questions, you can also leave snide remarks of anything that you like to do, you can also tell me where you're listening from and what platform you're listening on. This also helps me direct to my target audience. I am going to attempt to limit the profanity that I use in this podcast today, but what I want you guys to get get to know is the fact is I'm going to talk about one main subject, and then I'm going to give you a couple fillers. And on those fillers, I'm going to give you the context of today's title, and today's episode title is next up now it took me a while to even come up with that title because i was actually going to do a continuance of my defending jacob um video podcast type review slash live that got interrupted and that was corrupted via whatever reason but this actually kind of took precedence Because the topic itself is something that needs to be discussed because I want to give you a train of thought, but I also want to open you up to something that most people are not privy to. Because when you're looking at most situations, a lot of times we don't get two sides of it. And even when we get two sides, we still don't get the entire story. And today, I'm going to give you several points of view but I'm still not going to be able to give you a story in its entirety. I apologize for that in advance, but I'm going to give you my point of view on a situation. I'm going to give you some legal aspects in that point of view and the legal stance that I'm taking and why I'm taking that stance. But I'm also going to talk about something that's becoming an enormous issue. Because I talked about entitlement at one one point in time. And this is one of those horrible, horrible, horrible examples of entitlement. Because most people think that there are times where we can do something. It's somebody else's fault. And there are no consequences or repercussions from it. And then we're looking at most people when they're looking at this and we're kind of assessing the situation, we forget the ideals that are involved. And even within these ideals, what we also have to do is take into account what it is that we're trying to accomplish. And in that attempt, that's where our humanity needs to lie. That's where we need to be able to stand and move forward from. The problem is most people don't want to have a discussion They want to say that it's this way and that's it. And when in fact that that can't be it simply because what we have in front of us is not something that's a cut and dry situation. And today I want to talk about something that has been in the news, which should have been in the news long prior to the video surfacing. And yes, it's going to be about Ahmad Arbery and the Brunswick young man that was, in my opinion, murdered. Again, that's my opinion. That was murdered while it was said for him to have been jogging by a father and son. Now, I was doing this maybe for the past couple of days, because again, I didn't want to just grab something like most people have done and then just post something just because it's there. I want to actually get into it, get a little context, give you a little direction. But 
my first response from watching the video was like, without knowing the situation itself, was like, oh my God, that's murder. But then I looked at the video a little bit more in depth and I was like, oh, the father shot him and it's possibly manslaughter. Then I started watching the video and then I understood context. I went back and looked at police statements. I also looked at police reports. I listened to 911 calls. I got a better understanding of the situation. I started reading other things that were made available. And unfortunately, a lot of that wasn't made available at one time. It was made available on several instances and several levels. And that's where we come up with this because, again, the young man was Ahmaud Arbery in Brunswick, Georgia, and a former um, uh, Glen County police officer, that's 64, Gregory McMichael, and his 34 year old son, Travis McMichael. Well, the story is Gregory lives in a neighborhood. And in that neighborhood, there have been several burglaries or robberies, or however you want to say that. Well, the context of it is there was a description of the burglar or somebody that had burglarized. And Gregory not taking into account the totality of even the description. Gregory was never robbed. But Gregory saw this young man he took as running down the street. Well, in the context of this, Gregory tells his son, Travis, go get our guns, which was a sawed-off shotgun and a three fifty seven Magnum, and we're going to confront him. Now, the context of this is the fact that without provocation, without any instance, even looking at listening to some of the horrible examples that have been given, I've been watching several shows that have been talking about this. They often give the example of what if this, which then changed the entire context of what this situation was. When you're talking the what if game, I'm going to talk about what happened. Gregory McMichael, the former police officer, who had not been robbed, who had only secondhand information on a description that, because he had retired in May of 2019, had only been pretty much briefed on something that had happened and only had a description from one person and in the context of this is kind of going off a description that's not full. And then he just sees someone running. Now, when I first heard this, I had a young man, he was speaking on it. And he goes, well, if you're going jogging early in the morning, blah, 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 blah. Okay, cool. I've, I've heard about that because the young man in New York, he was 30 years old. He was a doctor. He was jogging in Central Park at 6 a.m. They took it as if he was running from someone. So someone called the police. And then in the midst of calling these police, this man was arrested. And then he spent 30 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. Well, this is a similar situation because Ahmad Arbery wasn't a criminal. He was not a suspect. He was not even the person described as the burglar. He was just on the street running. Now, what they don't tell you until later on, that there is a third person that's involved in this situation. But I'm going to get into that. Now, when you're looking at the context that I'm going to give you, it's the fact that Gregory, the retired police officer, made a conscious decision to follow somebody and confront them with a weapon without having any knowledge of who they were or having any idea of what it is that they could have, might have possibly done. He was trying to guess, but he was also in the context of doing something. <laughs> and, I, and I hate to say this. He was actually creating a situation that wasn't existing. 
And unfortunately, this is part of the program. People are watching TV and they're being programmed that people with dark skin are criminals. People with dark skin are violent. People with dark skin, and it doesn't help when these same people call themselves savages, refer to themselves as an animal. Because even you often heard me refer to myself as a monster. Because at the end of the day, sometimes when you're created that way, it's hard to break that stereotype. Where it's hard to break that stigma. And with me, it's understanding that what it is, is accepting it. But it's a second, it's another thing of being that. So, he was put into the image of being the burglar. Gregory then decides that a firearm is the best thing to do. And anybody that knows me, that has listened to me long enough, knows that anytime someone pulls a weapon on, on you, it is an aggravated assault because it's designed to create a certain response. Now, you often hear me talk about police officers' first duty is for the preservation of life. And the fact that the, they have seven to eight non-lethal options, this 30-plus police veteran, his first mindset, which is something I spoke about in coward training, was to grab not one, but two highly lethal weapons to have a conversation with someone he had no idea who they were that had not done anything, and he expected a response from them that he did not get. Now, to go deeper into this story, understanding, I'm going to give you Georgia, what, we, what most people call Georgia's vigilante law, or... Georgia stand your ground statue. And just in case you were wondering if I knew it, it's Georgia Organic Code, section 16-3-21. And it reads, a person that is being threatened by another person's use of force does not have a duty to retreat or back down before he or she can legally use force against the attacker. Now, each and every person across this country, whether they have, quote unquote, their stand your ground law or statute or code or whatever, you still have the right to defend yourself, your family, your property from an attacker. The problem is when you're talking about the Georgia stand your ground statute, it does not apply to this case because it says a person that is being threatened, George nor Travis were being threatened. George nor Travis had someone on their property. George, or oh, excuse me, I said George, Greg nor Travis were being threatened. Greg nor Travis had someone on their property. They saw, Greg saw someone running. That's it. There was no threat to Greg. There was no threat to Travis. Now, I'm going to give you the acts of performing a citizen's arrest. Because it's only done when they are witnessing a felony and they're protecting persons or property from that felony. They have to be witnessing it. Now, I'm going to go back to you on this. Because neither Greg nor did Travis witness um, Ahmaud Arbery committing a felony. Ahmaud Arbery was not witness committing a felony. Ahmaud Arbery was not witnessed engaging with other people. He was witnessed running. And when you're talking about someone that could have possibly might have wanted to burglarize, keep in mind, it's a few minutes after noon. The neighborhood that in question is an entire circle. And when you're talking about that neighborhood itself, it's easy because... It's very little traffic that goes in and out of that neighborhood and around it. So it is an ideal area for jogging because the traffic is one low. It's a quiet area and apparently there are not very many dogs because it's easily getting around. You're not going to get boxed in. These are the things that should unfortunately make it great for being robbed, which is probably why they're having an uptick in burglaries over there. Because again, the accessibility, 
the limited traffic. These things making it ideal for those those situations. Now, one of those situations is jogging. So if you see a man running down the middle of the street, because that was the context that somebody kept bringing up in the video. Running down the middle of the street. Running down the middle of the street. Okay, I have, I'm a person that lived in Atlanta for a very long time. Oftentimes, if I see a quote-unquote something that makes me uneasy, I will walk in the middle of the street. Why? Because it offers me an option to go from one side to the next. But if I'm in an area that has limited traffic, I will walk in the middle of the street. Because again, no one can say that I'm in their yard. No one can say that I'm being aggressive by walking towards their house or running towards their house. No one can say, I take away a lot of the things that can be said. That is one of the things that I took from the way he was jogging on the video because he was not near the sidewalks because there were no sidewalks, but he was also not near the, the, um, the edge of the road. He was damn near in the middle of the street. I understand that. Again, because it's something I do. I even do this now. Whether I'm in Texas, whether I'm in California, whether I'm in Atlanta, because I still do it when I go to Atlanta. Whether I'm in Augusta, it doesn't matter where I'm at, I do it. Except for New York. New York, they'll kill you out there. But it's, you know, that's because, yeah, that's something else. That's, that, yeah, it's something else. But, but it's something that I can see being done and why it was being done. The reasoning behind it, so to speak. But when you're talking about a burglary suspect, Let's say I do believe Ahmad Arbor was a burglar. Here's my problem. It's, it's 12 noon. It's not morning, but it's also not in the afternoon. It's 12. 12, 12, 30, right? He's wearing shorts and a t-shirt. Say that one more time. He's wearing baggy shorts and a baggy t-shirt. He's not concealing anything because if he's running... Even if he has a phone, it's going to be jumping around, which apparently he did not have on his person. If he had a weapon, it would be bouncing around, which it wasn't. Because of, if he was running, it would have been bouncing around and you'd have been able to see it. But these are things that are not visible. Why? Because his clothes were baggy. He did not have anything concealed. He didn't even have anything weighing himself down. And then the only crime that he had been quote unquote attempted of was one that was in somebody's mind. I'm gonna say this. It was in the mind of Greg. Greg took running as a crime. Greg took running as an act of criminality and he is a former police officer and this is the training he had. His his mindset was not just to go and have a conversation with this young man. His mindset was go get guns to confront this young man with. And the crazier part of that was he was seen jogging. No one witnessed him commit nor state that he had committed a crime. And he didn't even have people who tracked him down. And the greater part about that was even in the context of watching a felony, Greg said he didn't see one. They didn't say that he had committed a crime. So when you're talking about this, I want you to get that mindset. I want you to understand that. The person that tracked him down stated he saw nothing more than a young man running. That's it. That was enough for him to go get a gun. Matter of fact, that was enough for him to go get a shotgun and a 357 Magnum, jump in a truck, ask his buddy to film it. I'm going to say that again. It was enough, a young man jogging was enough for him to go get a shotgun and a 357 Magnum, jump in a truck, and then have his buddy film it. These are the things that are things that are mind-blowing. Now, I'm going to give you what, what nullifies nullifies the use of force, or when the use of force is not justified. And guess what? It's codified under the Organic Code, Georgia Organic Code, Section 16-3-21. When the use of force is not justified, one, if you are the 
initial aggressor. Now, I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit. I'm going to give you a little bit. If you state that you did not see this young man commit a crime, you state that you did not witness a felony, all you saw was this young man running. You didn't hear anybody hollering and screaming behind him. You didn't hear anybody say, go get in. You didn't hear any of that. Didn't see any of that. But your mindset is, go get a gun and go confront him. Guess what just happened? You are the initial aggressor. Because following someone just because, poking your nose in somebody else's business, and there is no context behind it, you are the aggressor because following them is the aggressive act. Wanting to confront them is an aggressive act. The problem is most people have no idea what aggression is because they don't want to take responsibility for anything that they do. They want to shift blame to someone else. But under the law, reading it, these are not my words. Georgia, stand your ground statute, organic code of Georgia, Section 16-3-21. A person that is being threatened. George Gregg was not being threatened. By another person's use of force. There is no force from jogging. Especially when he was not jogging towards their house. He was not jogging. and He was on their street. That's it. There was no cries for help. Does not have a duty to retreat. Now, the use of force is not justified when you are the initial aggressor. When he, when Greg made a choice to say, hey, Travis, who is now an actor in concert, he is an accomplice, go grab a gun to confront this other person. The confronter is the aggressor. I'm going to say that. The person doing the confronting is the aggressor. They are the ones that are initiating or instigating the situation. Again, not my words. That is law. Regardless of how you want to see that. That is what law is. And the other use of force is not justified. If you are committing a felony and or leaving a felony. Now, here's, here's the context. I'm going to get into that part of it later because, again, that is also something that existed in this situation. But as I go back, I'm going to give you, give you the entirety of the backstory that I have. Because back on February 23rd, 2020, at the intersection of Satila Drive and Holmes Road. Now, the neighborhood works in a circle and it's low traffic. The Glen County Police was told by Greg, the former police officer, he saw Ahmad running, told his son Travis to grab a shotgun and a pistol, which was a 357 Magnum, so they could go and confront him. Now, there is no longer an opportunity for stand your ground because Greg, in his call, said he told his son to go grab a shotgun and a pistol so they, they could go confront Ahmad, who he only stated he saw running. Absolutely pause for dramatic effect because I also want you to think. I want you to think. If I just told you a person that is being threatened by another person's use of force does not have a duty to retreat or back down before he or she can use, legally use force against that attacker. He saw Ahmad running. He told his son to grab a shotgun and a 357 Magnum so they could go confront him. When use of force is not justified if you are the initial aggressor, are you the one setting up the situation? Absolutely, it's done in this situation. And the police reports indicate that Greg and Traffic retrieved firearms, went after the running Ahmaud Arbery. Now again, they went after him. Doesn't that sound like an attacker? Their very actions 
say attack. They went after him. They put themselves in that situation. They became the aggressor. Because you remember I did a podcast called Predator and Prey. They became the predator. Ahmad was the prey. When you are the predator, you are the aggressor. You are the one that's attacking. You are the one that's hungry. You are the one that's setting up the situation. That's exactly what happened here. Now, Greg and Travis took a trip to cut him off. Now, again, later he spoke about how, Greg spoke about how he saw Ahmad running towards Buford. Now, what most people don't understand is when they, when they spoke about that the police was called to the intersection, it was called to the intersection of Celia and Holmes Road. Holmes par- or actually runs on top of Buford. Because again, remember I told you the entire neighborhood itself runs in a circle. Satila is where Greg lives. I'm going to say that one more time. Ahmad was running up Satila, which is part of the circle that's connected to Holmes and Buford and another road that starts with a Z. It runs in a big circle. But Buford and Holmes are pretty much interchangeable because one runs at an angle, the other one runs kind of straight off of it. I'm not sure if you understand those type of streets, but that's one of them. And he stated all he saw was him running. Ahmad then turns that corner to go down Holmes. Greg and Travis attempt to cut him off. Now, here's the great part about this. Just because you talk to somebody does not mean they have to return the favor and talk back to you. No one is entitled to speak to you. You are no one's keeper. No one has any obligations to you. You are not God. You are not someone's creator. You are only another person. And the craziest part about this is, again, when I spoke about entitlement, people feel that just because they ask you a question, you have to answer them. Because I'm one of them fuck you people. Because, yeah, I'm not going to answer you. And just like I gave you the story of my son, we were going around and he kept telling about, hello, 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 hello. And he was dumbfounded that the one person didn't speak back to him. I had to explain to him, not everybody is obligated to you. They don't have to speak to you. These men, Greg and Travis, felt that Ahmad had an obligation to speak to him because they cut off an entire road. Not because they saw this man commit a crime. Not because this man was doing something he had no business doing. They cut off a road because they felt that he had to explain himself and his actions to them. Yes, another pause for dramatic effect. Because I want you to understand that. That's the society we live in right now. That's the mentality most people have. That you are obligated to. You have the right to remain silent. Now, most people don't have the ability to. But you have the right to remain silent. You are not obligated to anyone other than God. That's it. As long as you remain true to you. And you do what you're supposed to do with you. That's it. Because you have to answer to you for your shit. That's it. Not anybody else. You don't owe anybody else a thing. Which is why I don't respond to trolls most of the time. Now, because if I'm speaking to a troll, it's because I feel like it. I'm bored. I'm I'm feeling like Richard Petty. That's what I'm doing. Because I'm going to be real petty. Because I'll be 47 cent. I ain't got to be a whole 50 cent. I'll be 47 cent because I'll be petty then. But other than that, I don't owe anybody an explanation for anything that I do. Because if I don't feel like talking to you, I just don't talk to you. Because you can actually ask my father that. I haven't talked to my father. I actually didn't speak to my father for damn near 10 years. of The final 10 years of his life. Because again, I don't have to. I'm not obligated to talk to someone that I love. 
my brother, I haven't spoken to him since November 12, 2012 because I'm not obligated to. This is somebody I love. I don't, nobody has an obligation over you. You don't owe anybody anything for any reason. Just understand that. And these people that have this entitlement mentality think that you have to do something. They blocked off a road. Now, here's the great part because this is one of the arguments that I heard on one of the channels that I watched this um, story because, again, it was bits and pieces that people get. And I actually went to multiple sources to get the entire story. They blocked off the road and Ahmad retreated and went away from their position. Basically, he completely turned completely around since they had blocked off the road because, again, he's jogging. He's working out. He's not doing anything wrong. He just turns around. They blocked off the road. They went, okay, cool. It's a circle. The neighborhood goes in a circle. So he turns around. This is how he ended up on the corner where the video, the piece of video that most of us seen, begins. They then ride past him and jump out with their guns. Why? Because they feel that Ahmad has an obligation to talk to them. And they feel that pulling a gun out on someone is the way to have them talk to you. I'm going to say that again. They felt that obligation that Ahmad had to them to have a conversation with them. And they felt the need to pull out guns to make him do that. And what you see is, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a richer story. I'm Because I, I, I feel it's necessary right now. I'm going to give you a richer story. There was a time in which I myself was confronted by some some good old country boys. And they felt that I had an obligation to them about something. The problem was, the first time they cut me off, because I was in high school, the first time they cut me off with the guns, it was it was kind of kiki, right? It was it was kind of kiki. You know, it was funny to me. Because I tell everybody, I went to a school where pull, everybody had a gun. We don't pull it out until it's time to use it. But that's the whole point. They pulled it out and I was like, oh, that's that's what they do. They, they, they pull it out. They want to show me that they got it. They want they, they want to show me that they had, had a gun. Okay, cool. So now what happens is. I said, you know what? I'm not gonna deal with them because they they playing. They they they, bull, they bullshit. So I turn around and I go walking in a different direction. The thing is, now they come and cut me off. Most people go into a fight or flight situation. The problem was, I wasn't by myself when this happened. My buddy yelled, ride. Now, for those that don't know what that means, that means leave, haul ass, do what you do, get on, get, get the moving. And he pulled out Mr. Thundermaker. Because again, what happens is that fight or flight situation, we also had guns, but we also knew don't pull it out until it's time to use them. My buddy decided, I don't even know if he was shooting in the air, but I know when he pulled that thing out, he started letting it ride. Yak it, yak it, yak it, yak it, yak it, yak it. And later he came to the house and we sat down. We were chilling. Now keep in mind, we were also in high school and had pistols. We were in high school. We didn't go through a background check. We didn't do none of that. But understanding, our fight or flight situation was two of us were told to take off running. The other one started shooting to make sure the other two could get away. Because if you're going to confront somebody and you're going to block their means of escape, you're going to deter them from leaving. You're telling them that it's fight time. It's go time. Because Ahmad, when they blocked the street the first time, again, the aggressive act. He retreated. He was not an attacker. 
So when they go back again and they sit there with their guns out to confront him a second time, they are the aggressors. The problem is, in his mindset, it's, do I run around him? Because again, one video, a young man told me, yeah, he ran around him. Okay, he, he runs around him the first time. If you're still there with a gun, you are no longer playing. Because the gun is out to be used. His flight situation was to fight for his life. Now, I'm going to give you again a second context of my opinion for this situation. And that being is when I initially watched the scuffle, I see the shotgun go off. Bow! I see them wrestling some more. Bow! See it wrestling more. Bow! And then all of a sudden, I see Ahmad kind of stagger off and then fall on the street. Then I see Travis jump off the back of the truck with the 357 in his hand. Now, my first mindset was like, oh my God, he shot him with a shotgun. Yeah, if he shot him with a shotgun, you know, that's crazy because the whole situation was avoidable. It was really, 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 really stupid. Because again, what was you expecting to happen? You're not a cop. And if your first mindset is to grab a gun to talk to somebody, you're an absolute coward. There's nothing else I can say about that. That is absolute cowardice. But then whenever I go back and read the police report, here's where, here's where I get kind of thrown. They said the fatal blow came from Travis. But they spoke about wrestling with the gun. So now I'm confused because, again, I saw the video before I saw any of the story. I saw Travis jump off the back of the truck with a 357. I saw Greg being wrestled with by Ahmad with a shotgun. I saw the shotgun go off several times, and then I seen Ahmad fall. But the police report says Travis delivered the fatal blow. My question is, when? When was that blow delivered? But then, here's, here's the second part of that. Why is Travis shooting at someone that's wrestling with his father from the back of a truck? Again, these are things that I put it out because it doesn't make sense to me. Maybe you can come up with something that gives me more clarity on that. Because, again, from what I saw versus what I'm reading are two separate issues. But then, when, as the tape ends, or as the video ends, and he's jumping off, he has the 357 in his hand. He's running over to Ahmad. Now, later in the police report, he says that Travis had blood on his hand because he went to roll over Ahmad to see if he did have a weapon in his baggy pants and t-shirts that he could not have been having with burglary tools or anything that be. And then you forget the context of it. You wanted this man to be a criminal. He was not. You wanted this man to be some sort of ignorant. He was not. He was a high school and college graduate. He was someone that was employed. He was someone that was not only benefiting himself, but he was benefiting those that were around him. Yet... For whatever reason, his jogging provoked a stance of he's a criminal, he's a burglar, and I need to confront him with a shotgun and a 357 Magnum. But I'm going to get some flack for referring to that action as cowardice. I'm going to get a little bit of flack from the rest of the stuff that I'm getting ready to say. But I also, I want to thank God for making me the way he is because he gave me very nice shoulders. I can carry a lot. I can put some stuff on there. And, and hell, I got some video to prove it. But anyway, I want you to understand. Those are the things that I want you to get in context. Those are the things that I want you to take note of. Because again, I'm going to get a little deeper. I'm going to give you a little bit more. I'm going to give you something that you, I'm going to give you something that you can feel. Because, again, 
when I when I talk about this, I'm gonna give you a little bit of context from my point of view on the video. Because the video shows a person pulling over behind the confrontation. That person was later identified as um, Byron Williams. And, or, William Robbie Byron. He's 50 years old and he was also the third person in the entire altercation because when you go back and you read the new police reports that were made probably the day after the video dropped and the statements were made, his name was given as Greg told his son to go get the shotgun and the 357. He told William Robbie Byron, 50 years old, to follow behind them and videotape it. Now, again, not sure why, for the most part, not sure, but I can understand this on one level. You're trying to prove what you were doing was lawful. You wanted to protect not only yourself, but the pers other person involved. I get that. But when you have the cop instincts kick in, and remember, it's what May. So it happened February 23rd. So you don't turn it in February. You don't turn it in March. You don't turn it in April. It shows up three and a half months later because the guy that you gave it to, William Robert By Byron or Brian or whatever, has turned it over to the GBI. Why? Because he knows something is wrong. He knows that they don't have the coverage of the Stand Your Ground statue. Why? Because they were the initial aggressors. They created the situation. They assumed instead of actually knowing. This is why police officers are not allowed to think. This is why police officers need the opportunity to get a warrant or get permission. Because they either need permission from you or they need permission from a judge. They cannot think for themselves. This is why whenever I tell you and I show you the Supreme Court case where they don't hire a lot of smart people. Because a smart person would question certain things. You're easily manipulating someone that is not very intelligent. It's easy to manipulate someone that has a single track mind that does not question anything. These are the people they hire. That is why when you have seven options that are non-lethal and your first job is the preservation of life, your first mindset is to reach for the one thing that takes life. When you think that it's okay to grab a shotgun and a 357 Magnum and a video camera to go talk to somebody, that is a disturbed, simple mindset. That is someone that is not mentally stable, period. Because at the end of the day, if you thought it was such a great idea, would it be okay for somebody to do that to you? To your son. Hell, how about your wife or daughter? Would that be okay if a person say, hey, I want to I wanna go get that girl number and you go up to her with a pistol pulled out? Do you think she's going to be happy to see you? Do you think she's going to be very welcoming? How many people are happy to see a gun put in their face? Let's, let, let's get that. How many people are comfortable with pistols shoved in their face? Because I know some people right now that went to war and had the enemy stick a rifle in their face. Somebody they didn't know stick a rifle in their face. I don't think they want to have a conversation. They end up living. Why? Because they shot their way out. Because that was part of their fight or flight. The understanding that if someone is showing you a gun, they're prepared to use it. 
when you're looking to retreat and then they cut you off a second time. Then they have their guns out. They're preparing to use it. You immediately go into a different mindset. Because again, I'm not going to keep turning around. I'm not Martin Luther King. I'm not going to keep turning the other cheek. I might turn around one time. But the second thing is, uh, yeah, I'm a confrontational dude. So you, you're you going to have to. Because I'm not going to talk to you. And you know what? I, I appreciate and I accept all my little blessings. I really do. Because situations, my size kind of keeps away from me. Because even big guys don't want to just readily deal with me. I have bigger guys that don't really want to, uh, because again, it's the what if factor. And just like I had a young boy, we were we were playing ball one day, and he told me, he said, oh, I'm going to knock your big ass out. I said, okay, cool. What happens when you hit me with that shot and I'm still there? What do you what, what's your, what, what's plan B? Cause I told myself at the end of the day, my plan A is to inflict as much bodily pain on you as humanly possible, and my plan B is to enforce plan A, because I'm too fat to run, I'm too stupid to be scared. I just want you to not be involved. I just I'd rather not you engage. I'd rather you don't engage with me. Because if you do, that is my mindset. One of us has got to go. One of us, because I'm, cause I've even had a fight where I've, been, I've asked to do, hey, do you want this? Are you sure? Because I don't want to give you this answer. I don't want to give you something that you don't want. I don't, I, do you want this? Is this the, this the answer you want? You know, because I got several of them. Do you want one of them? No, I don't want one. All right, cool. I'll give you an out because I don't want to fight. Because my whole mindset is completely different. And even in these situations, it's because I've been placed in... I, you know what? The one thing that most people say is, you haven't walked a mile in my shoes. You haven't walked a hundred feet in mine. I haven't walked in yours. I don't know. Because your mindset might be just as fucked up as mine. But at the end of the day, the whole context of what it is that you're trying to give me, the whole context of what it is that you want me to understand... What it is you're trying to get across to me. We grown enough to have a conversation about it. And I'll be damned if you pulling the pistol out on me. Because if you pulling the pistol out on me, you ain't trying to talk. What we what we talk what, what are we talking about that we gotta have guns out? I ain't going hunting. I I'm, I'm, I'm to be honest, if you pulling the pistol out in my presence, what are we talking about? There, if you pull a shotgun out, again, I'm not hunting. What are we talking about? Because if you pull one out, it's a great chance that there's going to be a use of that firearm. And while many don't understand this, because again, they try to place things into their own perspective or what they think they possibly might do. I can think of a lot of ones where, because even a young man called in, he spoke about how he's had situations where his He's had people that was shot that was running. He's had people that was shot that was wrestling with the gun. I've had people around me that have been shot while they were wrestling with somebody with a shotgun. And that's why whenever I looked at the video, that was my first mindset. Oh my God, he got shot with a shotgun. But to see the police report to state that, okay, Travis delivered the gun, the blow. Travis had a 357 Magnum. So that meant Travis, who never left the back of the truck, was shooting him from an elevated position. Travis himself, to me, did one of the most cowardice acts I've ever seen in my life. Because he didn't engage with him. He let somebody else engage, and then he, what, what I, call, I call the punk situation, he hit him from behind. He didn't offer him an opportunity to look him in the eye. And and that that's what to me, and again, this is opinion only, that portion, if Travis is the one who shot him from a elevated position inside the back bed of the truck, that becomes murder. 
then Greg becomes an actor in concert because they were the ones that were the aggressor because they didn't cut him off once, they cut him off twice. They went after him. He was not doing anything that he wasn't supposed to be doing. They initiated the entire situation. And that's what changed the whole thing. And again, when you show, show the video, the person pulling up, which we figured out was Byron, the police report stated that Travis is the one who fired the fatal blow. And however, the video shows Greg wrestling with Ahmad and the shotgun going off three times, Travis jumping down. Greg later stated he saw the suspect from the break-ins running towards Buford Drive. Now, the thing that, again, because Ahmad was not armed, he was also not the person that was described in the burglary. And he retreated when initially confronted. He didn't dart through the woods. He didn't run through somebody's yard. He merely turned around. Oh, okay. Can't go that way. Not a big deal. Because again, these country towns, they have little roads where you can't go down there. I've been to Brunswick. I've been to Brunswick several times. Brunswick is not a place that I actually fancy because it's entirely too country for me. But I do know that there are times where they hold stuff just like in New York. They hold little block parties. They actually have parties where they block off portions of a street. Guess what? It's possible that that was a normal thing for him. He didn't think anything of it. But it is not normal to confront someone with a shotgun and a 357 Magnum and somebody following behind you in a car videotaping. Those aren't normal things. And to understand that, what kills me is the fact that you, you know the Brunswick DA, Jack Johnson, recused himself from the case in February because Greg is a former employee of the county. Now, here's, here's where it starts to get fun. Because the Waycross DA, and I actually think they changed the change the context of it, but George Barnhill. George Barnhill. Yeah, George Barnhill is actually very interesting to me. He recused himself because his son worked with Greg prior to his retirement in May 2019, and that means the retirement of Greg. Greg was a retired police officer from the um, Glen County Police Department, and George Barnwell's son worked with the um, Glen County Police Department. Now, again, they were apparently friends because Greg retired in May 2019. Now, here's the thing that got funny to me because most people didn't think a whole lot of most of the situation because from what everyone understood, it was just Greg McMichael, Travis McMichael, and Ahmaud Arbery. That was it. Those were the only people involved in this. All right? However, in George Barnwell recusal letter, because again, this is why I tell people, you don't do things and then you add a bunch of folks to your mix, which is why their greatest bank robberies, only one person survived because they killed their accomplices. When you're looking at the context and why your mama tell you, hey, don't be doing everything with everybody or letting everybody know your business. Because social media has given cowards an outlet. And then the idea of attention is something that is dangerous because these loose lip friends is what triggered a deeper investigation into this because George Barnwell in his recusal letter stated that Travis Greg McMichael along with Byron Williams who again prior to that recusal letter no one knew about because Byron Williams didn't say anything. He didn't say, oh, oh, it was me, it was me, it was me. No. He didn't say anything. He just turned the table. Here you go. 
It was them two bastards. That's it. And they were following in hot pursuit a burglary suspect with solid first-hand probable cause. Now I'm 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 gonna re re I'm a, I, 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 you know what I gotta say that one more time I gotta say it one more again because he said Travis and Greg McMichael along with Byron Williams were following in hot pursuit a burglary suspect with solid firsthand probable cause. Now I'm the, I don't know if if you guys listen to me enough to understand what it is that I'm getting ready to say. Now, I don't know. And if you're first time listening, to hold on. Because I'm getting ready to say some, some real ignorant stuff right now. And, and ignorant on the level of the lack of understanding why someone would implicate and use words that are not privy or even coincide with, with the person who's involved in this situation said. Because for me, this becomes stupid. Now, in Greg's initial statement to police, Greg stated he did not see Ahmad do anything other than running on the road. Now, let me read this jackass's statement that he wrote down on paper, put in the public record. Travis, Greg, and Byron Williams were following in hot pursuit. You know, this guy that was jogging. A burglary suspect with solid first-hand probable cause. Okay, now anybody that knows any minuscule portion of law, they understand the first portion is probable cause only comes from a crime. Now, while he stated a burglary suspect, we also went back to talk about that Greg didn't, he stated he didn't see him do anything other than running. Didn't see anything, nobody's hollering, none of that. Nobody's saying that he did anything. Greg said he didn't do anything. Solid first-hand probable cause. And if probable cause only comes from a crime, Gregory did not have a proper description of the burglary suspect. I'm going to say that one more time. Gregory did not have proper description of the burglary suspect. You know who said that? The Glen County Police Department. They said that is not the description, or Ahmad did not fit the description of the person that they thought was burglarizing that area. So, there was no burglary suspect and probable cause come from witnessing a felony. Now again, nobody stated that anything was even done. Ahmad didn't have any anything on him. So, there was nothing tangible that could have allowed for a warrant or police action. So, what probable cause could they possibly have had considering the only thing they saw him do was run by. He was wearing shorts and a t-shirt. And it was one, almost 1 p.m. in the afternoon because it was afternoon. And it was set almost 1 because it wasn't 1 o'clock. Didn't see anything. He's wearing shorts and t-shirt and he's running. That became hot pursuit. And that he became a suspect and Automatically, they had probable cause. Now, if they are the good guys, and they are to be looked at as honest people, and if this action was lawful, just as Greg Barnhill, excuse me, George Barnhill, has stated, why lie about it? Why add events to something? That he himself did not witness. Nor did the people involved in state. Why add this? Because I tell you. Words have power. Words have context. And the only point of view I'm giving you. Is legal point of view. 
I give you a couple of opinions because I'm talking about the actions of the person. I don't know either of these men involved in any way, shape, or form. So when I speak about at, um, cowardice, I'm speaking about their actions represent that of a coward. I'm speaking about their actions representing that of someone that's dishonest. I'm talking about their actions that are representing what it is that I'm speaking of in an opinionated manner. Because again, those are just my opinions. That's not fact. That's not law. But that is my perception. But again, when you're talking about law and you're painting a picture, you're trying to provoke someone's perception to believe that something is done that is not there. And this is what this man, George Barnhill, was attempting to do. Notice I used the word was because it did not work because, again, sometimes you can't believe any of what you hear and only some of what you see. And in the fact of this, when you're able to understand probable cause is something that's tangible, nothing in seeing him run was tangible. Nothing, because see, remember, a, only a warrant can be written on probable cause. What was able to be offered as a warrant for police, even in this situation, for probable cause. Nothing. Because I always tell you. Probable cause is something that's tangible. There has to be a crime. If there was no crime. Then there is no reason. And again. There was no obligation for him to talk. He wasn't a burglary suspect. He was a dude that was running through the neighborhood. That they did not know. And he went on to state. It appears. Their intent. Was to hold the suspect. Under Georgia law. This is legal. Now, I'm going I'm to I'm go back. I'm going to go back a little bit because what I want you to understand is because I, I gave you a couple, couple reasons, right? To perform a citizen's arrest, one must be protecting a person or persons or property from a felony. George's, Greg's original statement was I saw him running. To perform a citizen's arrest, one must be protecting, must be protecting a person or persons or property from a felony. Those aren't my words. Those aren't my words. Well, how eloquent they are to state that it appears there, it appears. Because I'm going to give you every statute that deals with a crime, deals with intent. Intent is mens rea. Without mens rea, without intent, there is no crime. Because it appears their intent was to hold the suspect. And at no point under Georgia law, under common law, under citizen's law, is this legal. Because they had nothing tangible other than an idea that was in Greg's head. I'm going to say that one more time. They had nothing tangible other than an idea that was in Greg's head. That's it. There was nothing special. There was nothing there. There was, you know what? Because again, Georgia Stand Your Ground Statute, Georgia's Organic Code, Section 16-3-21 states a person that is being threatened by another person's use of force does not have a duty to retreat or back down before he or she can legally use force against an attacker. The problem is, when you're looking at this situation in its totality, at no time is Ahmad an attacker. 
At no time is he an aggressor. And for someone like Mr. Barnhill to state that this action is legal is the most asinine thing I've ever heard in my life. Because nowhere is it written on any portion of what they, even what they say. Because again, I'm not using anything other than law, their statements that was written on police reports. Because again, you know, a lot of these places that were doing actual legwork to find the true story, they got police reports. Police reports become public record. And these are things that you can search for and look up yourself. And then he goes on to state, Barnhill goes on in his resignation or recusal letter. He then cites a portion of the statute. And again, a private person may arrest an offender if, remember I told you the biggest words in law, if and or. If the offender is committing in his present or within his, within his immediate knowledge. <laughs> I love, I got to, you got to you got to love ignorance because again he's attempting to paint a picture he's attempting to persuade he's attempting which he almost got away with because again this this resident recusal letter along with the video is what got this father and son in the position that they're in right now I just want you to understand that because again, there are a lot of things that are put in this, which now makes others put into context what it is that they're doing. So, a person may arrest an offender if the offense is committed in his or her presence. Greg's initial statement to police stated, there was no witnessing of an offense. Second part of that or within his immediate knowledge. The immediate knowledge in this legal application means firsthand. Well, Greg stated that he had not been robbed and never stated he had firsthand knowledge, only spoke of not knowing or seeing Ahmad prior, which eliminated the immediate or firsthand knowledge and the string of robberies in his neighborhood. He attached Ahmad to those robberies. Ahmad did not match the description and he himself was not robbed. So he had neither of these accounts available to him for this portion of Barnhill's argument. Neither one of these apply to Greg McMichael who initiated this entire thing or Travis McMichael or even Robbie Byron. None of these people had this that attached to him. And later when Barnhill was asked after the video surfaced and people read off on this recusal letter, Barnhill refused to do it publicly. He refused to stand by his own words publicly. But he wrote the video exonerated the McMichaels. I'm going to say that. I'm going to say that. The, he wrote, he didn't do a video, he didn't do any public interviews. He wrote, the video exonerated the McMichaels. Now, a lot of times when you hear me speak, you hear me speak, and I, I'll tell you firsthand, I'm biased to shit. I'm talking from a place of being hurt. I'm talking from a means of pain. Not ashamed to admit it. Don't give a shit how you feel about it. It is what it is. But again, I want to give you a second opportunity to just, I want, I'm, because again, my words are used as perception. However you perceive it, however you look at it, however you draw from it, that is what I'm attempting to do today. That is what I'm attempting to do every day. Because again, I'm trying to help you, quote unquote, get out the matrix. Because it is not the spoon that bends. Because Spoon is the societal perspective of how things are. I'm giving you the reality of how things are. And I'm going to give you, but I have to do it with a little bit of context clues. And the context that I want you to understand is 
Many of us have seen the movie Boys in the Hood. There was a scene in Boys in the Hood where Ice Cube walks up to a group of people that are arguing and he lifts his shirt. Under his shirt, they see that he has a 9mm. His question is, do we have a problem? I want you to also understand something. I like a movie called Righteous Kill. It's not very good acting throughout the movie, but it's, it's poignant. In the context of understanding the ideals to live up to something else. And in it, De Niro reads, most people respect a badge. Everybody respects a gun. In this cutscene with Ice Cube and Boys in the Hood, Ice Cube didn't go to have a conversation. Ice Cube came to let you know that if we wanted to have a conversation, it wasn't going to be with words. That's why he showed them their gun. And if you remember, everyone stopped talking. Because my grandmother, she didn't understand something that I used to do. And I used to say some things, and some of the stuff I would say to my children would be wild. It, it would just be the wildest thing ever. And she would look and be like, you can't say that. And the thing is, I told her, I said, I said it's not that I'll follow it through. I said, but the person that's giving the threat, whoever he's giving it to or she's giving it to, they must believe that he will follow through on it. I said that to say this. I want you to pay close attention. When Greg and Travis got into their trucks with their shotgun and 357 Magnum, and they cut off Ahmad from the first time. He didn't perceive them as a threat. He didn't perceive them as anything more than people that was out there in the neighborhood. That was it. He perceived them as a threat. When he looks up, they pass by him, and then they get out with guns. He's in a mist of understanding. I can't outrun them. I have to do something. His mindset is fight. That's what that's that's what I took it from. Because even for the first portion of going around them, that is not perceiving them as a threat. But when you engage with someone that consistently antagonizes you. That's where the threat lies. That's when a decision has to be made. This is what I talk about when you see hear me speak about predator and prey. These are the things that I impress upon you. Because at some point, you're going to have to stand up, throw down, and be willing to die. Regardless of what it is, you have to choose when that fight is coming. But sometimes when you don't have that option and someone forces the fight upon you, what are you going to do now? Because a lot of people say, oh, I'd have, I'd have ran in another direction. So basically what they're saying is they would have kept running in circles. The mouse on the Ferris wheel. At some point, you have to understand, okay, it's two of them. Where can I go? I can't outrun a bullet. I can't outrun their truck. They both got guns. They obviously don't have good intentions. What am I going to do now? Because again, you bring a gun to a situation. What, you bring a gun to a conversation. What are we talking about? Because when you look at this and you see the mindset, these aren't things that make it better. A firearm doesn't make a conversation better. A firearm is not going to make me listen to you more. Because I'm going to give you another I'm going to give you another one of those. Most people, whenever you rob them and you put a gun in their face, guess what they cannot do whether you're wearing a mask or not? They can't identify the person who pulled the gun. You know why? Because the only thing they're focused on is the gun. That's not my words. 
Those are scientific facts. Why? Because the gun is the threat. The gun is the lethal life-taking instrument. It is the thing that can end you right now in the blink of an eye. The brain remembers two things, pleasure and pain. We also have ideals of perceived pleasure and perceived pain. We are programmed to believe a gun is painful. We're programmed to believe a gun will take life. That is why the response is, every, some, most people respect the badge, everybody respects the gun. Nobody pays attention to you because you're unimportant. You are not that important for someone to have the conversation with you. I don't, if I ask you a question, you don't answer me, guess what I'm going to do? Go some goddamn where else. Nobody cares. I'm not that important that you have to answer everything I say to you. I am not that important that you have to do anything I say to you. I, you don't have to respond. I don't have to respond to you. I don't have to respond to police. I don't have to. I don't have to. The only one person I got to answer to, and they ain't on this planet. So we get it how we live. And if you're making a choice, you're understanding what it is, you have to understand the context. Because if you feel that I owe you something, you can kiss my ass with your tongue out. Because that's how you need to take it every time you talk to me. Because if I talk to you, it's great. If I don't talk to you, it's great. Because I'm going to be that same dude every night when I lay down. I'm going to sleep like a brick and I'm going to enjoy it because I'm going to be at peace. Because I don't owe you anything. I don't have to answer to you for any reason. But if I do choose to talk to you, it's my choice. Because the one thing that I loved about a lot of the things that um, I've gone through is the fact that it built a character. I feel certain obligations not to anybody else but to myself. Because I create my, a mindset of where I should be, where I need to be, and how I need to be there. Which is why I don't put out things every day. Which, you know, I have to be better with doing these podcasts. Because at the same time, I need to be able to give you substance every time I'm sitting behind this mic. Every time I'm looking at this computer screen. Every time I'm looking at one of these cases. Every time I'm looking at something to give you. I'm doing it to feed you. I talk about giving you meals, but if I can't give you that meal, what the hell am I doing? I am wasting your time. I am wasting my time. I am wasting resources that have been made available to me. I am wasting the talent. I am wasting a whole lot of things if I can't give you quality. If I can't give you something to make you better today than you were yesterday, I have failed. And that is not what I'm planning on doing. I do not fail. I do not give up. I am persistent and I am focused. And I am not obligated to anyone for anything. And that's where the entitlement mentality breaks our society to bits. Because at some point, you have to go deeper into the context of even this situation. Because Unfortunately, it's not a solo situation. It's not a solo act. It's not something that's been done once or twice or three times. And in fact, it's something that is horribly becoming an, a regular occurrence. Because again, people think you are obligated to them. And to shed more light on this. I believe Greg was the one that was on the 911 call after the fact. The problem is, when the situation first started, Greg's mindset was to go run someone down. That's a vigilante mindset. That is not my words. Those are actually written as the definition of vigilanteism. Because Greg is no longer a police officer. Greg, nor his son, nor um, Robbie, made a phone call to 911 until after the murder. And what's even worse was there were several neighbors that had made 911 calls before, during, and after the altercation. They allow escalation. And we talk about how police escalate situations. And 
These are things, again, that I talk about not to hurt, but to point out. Because there is something wrong with that. Sometimes you have to be able to offer somebody an alternative to what it is they currently have. And the most profound thing that I found in this case was not the idea of them originally not being charged. It wasn't even the idea of um, Barnhill lying and looking for an excuse for them to be right. But it was the idea of originally they were wondering who leaked the tape. And then I got to thinking the only person that had it was William Robert Bryant and the GBI. So I was like, oh, it hit me. They're wondering who at the GBI leaked it because William didn't. It didn't come from, from Brunswick. So how did the tape get out? How did the video get out? But then when you're talking about other aspects, and this case finally gets to the Atlantic Circuit DA, Tom Durden's request, right? And he talks about holding a grand jury. And that's where I was going to give you context of defending Jacob because that entire series begins and kind of deals within the constructs of a grand jury in a criminal case and understanding the indictments and the process of, you know, the the judicial system on a, on a level of supposed to be initiation, partiality. The problem is, the reason why these other two DAs recused themselves was not necessarily because they couldn't get him indicted. It was because they were friends. I mean, it's nothing more, nothing less. Tom Durden made a choice to hold, in, hold it because there was public scrutiny and public pressure. And what happened is, yeah, you get an indictment, you got the true bill, blah, 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 blah. The great part about this is when I finished actually writing this, the indictment hadn't happened. As I'm recording this, the father and son not only were arrested at their home by the GBI, and I appreciate how they did it because they treated them just like criminals and they treated them like they were dangerous, but they were also denied bond. Now, here's the constructs of my ideals on even that action. It's one of those where you look at the fact that there are only a couple reasons people can be denied bond. And the simple reason here was they are a threat to society. What makes them a threat, Richard? How are they a threat? Well, glad you asked that. They are a threat to society because when your idea of having a conversation is to, one, tell your son to go get you a shotgun and your son is to grab a 357 Magnum and then you tell your friend to come videotape it, that's special. When you decide that someone who is a high school and college graduate and running that they're doing something illegal and you feel confronting them, although no one else is hollering, no one else asked for your input, no one else asked for you to intervene. There was no one being injured. There was no crime being committed. But you made a conscious choice. Keep that in mind. He made a conscious choice to go and engage with this young man. Not on one occasion, but two occasions. And the result happened as the death of this young man. That is a societal danger. Because these are things that I constantly say are being done by police. So does this action from a former police officer surprise me? Not in the least. 
But what it also doesn't do, it doesn't alarm anyone that's interacting with them. There are GoFundMes up. And I've seen GoFundMes being taken down for like the most minute thing. But the simple fact that there are several GoFundMes up for these young men. The father and son who made a choice that someone was a criminal. To refer to them as good people and all this other stuff when their actions in this case did not resemble those compliments because that's exactly what they are when you tell me somebody's good and then their actions are to go out and create something that is not good for whatever reason because you can have the best intentions that does not make the result of it good because I had the intent one night of surprising my ex-wife uh, with dinner and a massage and all this other stuff. You know what happened? I got surprised. My intentions were good. That didn't mean the results were great. So someone's intent, which is why they're called accidents, which is why, unfortunately, this cannot be anything other than when you're dealing with somebody, if I confront somebody, if I go out here right now and confront somebody with a shotgun in my hand and me and that person get into a tussle and somehow this person becomes lifeless, so to speak, I am not only responsible for that person's death, I'm also responsible for their life. I'm going to give you both context in that. It's a simple fact that O.J. Simpson was not found guilty of Ron, uh, was that Ron Goldman and Nicole Simpson's murder, right? He wasn't found guilty of their death. But he lost everything civilly because he was found responsible for their life. That's the exact same thing I talk about when I'm talking about when a police officer pulls out a gun, which is an aggravated assault. They take the life of someone that their first job is to preserve their life. They take that life. They are not only obligated because we're looking for criminal charges in every instance. That is not what this is. Other, if it's not um, death by um, police suicide, it is the police's obligation to pay for that life. Now, does most people pursue that? No, because that's a wrongful death lawsuit. The problem is, is the understanding of where that plays in, how that plays in, and what context placates that exact duty. Because most people don't understand because the program is not available to them for that. But when you're talking about this instance, when they went out, they initiated the contact, not once, but twice. Where they were the aggressors because he avoided them. They continued to instigate him. They uh, um, continue to aggravate him. They initiated this. This now is elevated to a felony loss of life, which is why you see the charges of aggravated assault as well as murder. Now, is this premeditated? I don't think this is a murder one situation. I actually think this is possibly murder two. Now, the only reason I would not use manslaughter is because Gregory McMichael, who Ahmad was wrestling with, was not the one who delivered the blow, but he also has to take the exact same responsibility of Travis because Gregory is the one who initiated this event in its entirety. Because now, I'm going to give you a little um, Glen County Police Chief side note. Because, again, this plays into some of the things that I speak about. The Glen County Police Chief, John Powell, is currently on administrative leave with pay. And he himself has been indicted. Through his indictment are three counts of oath violations. Now, I know there are a lot of people that tell me, Oh, well, there is no such thing as an oath violation. Nobody has ever been charged with oath violation. Well, the Glen County Police Chief, John Powell, has three of those. Those non-existent charges that you spoke about. 
and that is in Georgia. There's also another young man I spoke about in Georgia that he was also brought up by the feds on oath violations. So when I speak about these things, guess what happens? They magically show up like, uh, you know, uh, like, I, 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 you know, I hate this. I hate to say certain things. I really do. Because, again, people think the stuff that I'm giving you is stuff that I'm making up or it's on my own or somehow I'm sitting in the lab and I'm just creating bullshit. Yeah, I can't create that. Because this dude has a Christmas list of shopping, of charges. And it's three counts of oath violation, two counts of influencing a witness, and one count of criminal attempt to commit a felony, and a partridge in a pear tree. Because Greg's former boss chose not to arrest him. This, I'm going to say that one more time. John Powell, Greg's former boss, chose not to arrest him, who has... Three counts of oath violation. Two counts of intimidating a witness. I'm going to say that. But but again, these are good people. He's influencing a witness, but he, he, he's a good person. We should trust him. And one count of criminal attempt to commit a felony. This is a police officer who's on paid leave, who's making six figures, but you want me to hold a dude at McDonald's at a higher standard than this fuckboy. And again... I don't know this man, but everything that I'm looking at are the same things that people tell me. Oh, well, I can't teach you this. I can't give you what I'm reading and interpretations or any of that stuff because I was charged with a felony. I have several criminal things in my background. What about this cop? Is this the same person that you want me to trust? He has several. He's, in, he's under a current indictment of three oath violations which means he violated someone's civil rights multiple times. He influenced the witness twice, and he committed a felony. But he's a good guy, making six figures, and he's at home on paid leave. But the context of this is understanding that, again, the obligation or the, the mindset of I'm entitled and you have to do something for me or you're going to have to do something. And if I do something wrong, it's your fault. I did it because you made me. And that's where a lot of these people at. Because I even listen to a lot of these people that are online and say, oh, well, he, Ahmad should have done this. Ahmad should. Why? Why is Ahmad obligated to do anything other than what he was doing? Why was there an obligation for Ahmad to do something when Greg made a choice to interfere with what Ahmad was doing. Travis chose to follow Greg's um, initiation. Travis and Greg made choices to interfere with what Ahmad was doing with no reasoning behind it, but Ahmad had the obligation to do something else. How in the hell does that make sense? Ahmad should have done something. Well, Ahmad tried to do something twice. He went around them and he turned around. He didn't engage with them twice. So what else was Lamar supposed to do? How many times is he supposed to not engage? How many times is he supposed to not deal with them? How many times? Because those are the things that people are not having a conversation about. Now, I'm going to give you another one of those entitlement mentalities. Because... Two days ago, Anthony Trifelli, tri you know what, Anthony T-R-I-F-I-L-E-T-T-I, -T -T he's 24 years old, murdered Doug Lewis, 39 years old, after a traffic stop. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up, because in the midst of this, is the context of this story. And I actually use stop, but... For the most part, it was a traffic accident. Well, what happened is Anthony was traveling along the road and Doug Lewis hit him from behind. You know, traffic accident. Well, both men get out of their cars. And Anthony Telfair goes on to speak about, I got out to exchange insurance information. 
I took pictures of the damage to the rear end of my car. Now, here's where the story gets fun. When he's arrested, yeah, I, I left a really big hole in that, didn't I? When Anthony is arrested for shooting Doug Lewis, his story gets kind of weird. Because this young man who said that they were, both men got out of the car, both were a little upset, both went to exchange insurance information, and Anthony had the wherewithal to take pictures. Sounds like a pretty calm, normal accident, right? He stated that after he took pictures, or while he was taking pictures, Doug Lewis jumped out the car and he yelled out, oh, I'm GD, I'm GD, I'm GD. And he was afraid, Anthony, for his life because Doug was an armed gang member. What? What? Okay. Hey, go to the crazy part. That's not where the story gets weird. Just keep that in mind. That's not where the story gets weird. Now, I'm going to point out something. He says this man jumped out of the car yelling, I'm GD, I'm GD, I'm GD. Okay. Give you a little backstory on Doug. Doug actually is a delivery driver. He works for um, multiple delivery deliveries. Is that right? Delivery services. One is Amazon because he does Amazon Prime deliveries and a couple other ones. But for the most part, that's what he's a delivery driver. And understanding anybody that works with delivery, if you're in an accident, especially of this nature, the first thing they're going to do is take your license. If you t if you drive for a living. That is your job, and they take your driver's license. Yeah, you're going to be a little upset. I get that. But the funny thing about it is when the police interviewed people on the scene, one officer noted that the response when asked, did Doug Lewis ever state that he was GD or a gang member, or did anybody feel threatened? The faces that people made. Keep in mind, I talk shit about police officers and their officer statements. But the, but sometimes you have to pay attention to what's being said. This police officer noted he interviewed several witnesses in this incident. When he asked about Doug Lewis referring to himself as a gang member or... Did anyone around the situation feel fearful or afraid of Doug Lewis? Everyone made a face. Now, when he started describing the facial expressions, it was almost of utter shock. Like, what in the hell it is that you are talking about? Because no one else other than Anthony and his passenger heard Doug yelling, he was a gang member. No one else other than Doug, I mean, none other than Anthony and his passenger become fearful of Doug. Now, here's the real, the real weird part of this entire story. So, I spoke about on a podcast a little while back how El Paso is not one of those places where uh, a lot of people do a lot of things, but I know in Georgia, anytime there's an accident, the first thing they want you to do is go ahead, and take your couple pictures, then get the hell out the middle of the road so traffic can keep flowing. Okay, I get you. Yeah, I got it. Now, what happens is, while Anthony is taking his pictures, Doug goes and parks out the roadway. Doug is rolled down. He's looking through his stuff for his insurance information. Anthony drives up next to Doug and shoots him four times and drives off. Yeah, that's weird, right? 
that's the dramatic effect I want you to understand because that's a pondering moment. That's where I want you to think about something. For some reason, in Anthony's head, he perceived Doug as a threat. He thought it was okay to shoot him four times and drive off. Then was surprised when the police showed up at his house after a traffic accident and a shooting, which he thought was lawful, and charged him with murder. He was surprised. No one heard the statements. He said, they didn't hear what he heard. They didn't feel as he felt. But he felt that somebody else was obligated to see the world as he did. And what I enjoyed about this was the simple fact that it took less than a couple of hours for the DA to come back with second degree murder. Because again, I don't think it was planned. I think it was really, really stupid. I think it is super unnecessary. But I don't think it was one of those things. But again, it goes back to temperament and the ideals of someone that's obligated to do something for you and to see things the same way you do. Then we go into Hannah Payne. Hannah Payne is the young lady I spoke about in Atlanta where I did the podcast, I think it was maybe 15, 20 minutes long, called The Zimmerman Project. I'm not sure if you remember that one, but, you know, George Zimmerman went out after being told, not once, not twice, not three times, but nine times, by police, do not follow, do not engage. Do not follow, do not engage. Do not follow, do not engage. He chose to follow. He chose to engage. He got into a wrestling match with Trayvon. And then he shot Trayvon and somehow managed to pretty much lawyer his way out of it. He paid to get out of that. Because for whatever reason, he thought that Trayvon was obligated to talk to him. He thought that he did not have to listen to the um, 911 dispatch, nor do what they asked him to do. And Hannah Payne was also one of these people. Hannah Payne chased down and murdered 60 year old, 62 year old Kenneth Herring. She lied to the dispatch several times. She followed um, Kenneth after she witnessed Kenneth um, in a car accident. And then when Kenneth stopped his car because he was having a medical emergency where he could not make it to anywhere else other than where he had made it to. Hannah yet tells the 911 operator who had told her previously seven times, do not follow, do not engage, do not follow, do not engage. Hannah jumps out of her Jeep after blocking Kenneth in who was having a medical emergency with a pistol in hand. Walks up to Kenneth, shoot Kenneth, Kenneth dies. She yells to the 911 operator, he killed himself. Hannah then was surprised that she was charged with secondary murder because she felt that Kenneth had some sort of obligation to her. She felt that she wanted to be a superhero she felt she needed the attention of saving the day. And when I tell you, social media is giving cowards an outlet. The hardest thing about business is minding your own. Sometimes I hate the fact that whenever I go to places like New York, and most people don't feel any desire to even be nice. They don't help bystanders. They don't help strangers. It allows me to appreciate El Paso. But at the same time, it also allows me to appreciate them. Because that's your business. You take care of your own shit. Because here's the thing. Here's the thing. And then I'm going to start closing. I gave you a bunch of situations where you had someone dying shit senselessly for something that was stupid, unnecessary, 
uncalled for, and that could have been avoided if someone just did not feel entitled for something or had just went about their own business. I often speak about people have the right to remain silent, but the inability to do so. Everyone should mind their own business, but they probably won't because they also lack that ability to mind their own business, which is a double-edged sword because just like I appreciate people in El Paso not minding theirs, I also appreciate the people in New York and places like that that do mind theirs. Because I understand both sides of it. Now, it's not a point to where I want anyone to listen to what I'm talking about and agree with me. That's not what this is. It's one of those where I want you to sit down and honestly think. What, what side of the fence are you on? What side are you choosing? Because honestly, that's what this becomes. Are you one of those people... That everyone has to talk to you. Are you like my son? Hi, 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 hi. Or are you that person that says, you know what, he ain't got to speak for me. Everybody's not built like that. Because had Greg just noticed him jogging, had he just noticed Ahmed jogging, and just made note, Guy running around the neighborhood. Hell, even taking a picture or two. He didn't have to confront him. He could have kept going about his day. Greg, Travis aren't in jail. They're not denied bond. And Ahmad is still jogging every day. Had Hannah decided that, you know what? I gave the police a description of Kenneth Hammond's vehicle. I'm just going to keep my ass where I'm at and go about my day. It's a great possibility Kenneth Heron gets the medical attention he needs. Hannah Payne isn't in prison. Had George Zimmerman just listened to the 911 operator, Trayvon Martin graduates from high school and probably is introduced to something a little bit better because he was he was there with dad and mom felt dad was the best situation for him. Maybe we see a reasoning for Trayvon Martin. Maybe we see a Trayvon Martin in college now. Maybe we know Trayvon for something other than being murdered. Understanding that we all are energy in itself. Our energy from happiness, our energy from emotion, even our energy from speaking, gives others energy, whether it's positive or whether it's negative. But it's also energy that is derived from our direct ideals of what it is and how we see ourselves as we are in the world. There are times that we look at things and we look for social media for validation. The problem is when we start to live and project ourselves onto others that are in our actual life and we're not able to separate the social media or even the mindset of needing that attention or being an authority or having some sort of power, it takes us to places where people with no obligation or even idea of who we are, become more important than they should be. When we're putting people on these type pedestals, that's where the danger lies. Are you going to be one of those people that allow it to continue? Are you going to be one of those people that allow it to escalate? Are you going to be one of those people that sit down and think about it? Or are you going to be one of those people that stand up, throw down, and be willing to die for it? That's all I got for you today. Continue supporting the podcast. I'm going to be on SoundCloud for the next 30 days because if you're not supporting today, I'm pulling it down. But just know I love each and every one of y'all. 99 cents, $4.99 and $9.99 a month and continue supporting us on YouTube because the members only section is coming. I love you guys. Supreme out. I'm going to show you how great I am.